To talk about Arturo Toscanini and music is to talk about Arturo Toscanini, period. Music from the day he entered the conservatory in Parma in uh, 1876, when he was nine years old, until practically the day of his death, more than 80 years later, music was what absorbed him more than anything else. His dedication to his art was total and almost all-consuming through almost in his entire life. The Milanese dialect poet Delio Tessa, who was a friend of the Toscanini family, described how when you would talk with Toscanini, he would listen very interestedly, but at a certain point he would sort of fade out. And you could tell that he was thinking about what he was working on at that time, what he was studying, what piece of music he was dealing with, either in rehearsals or simply mentally. And then he would fade back in again after a while. And people were accustomed to this. He was so dedicated to music that everything else in his life became secondary in comparison. His concept of his responsibility as a musician was something bordering on religious fanaticism. He believed that it was the responsibility of a performing musician to come as close as possible to expressing the thought the concept of the composer whose work he was performing at that time. It was really an all-consuming passion for him. And in fact, his reputation as being very tough on orchestras, on being very demanding with singers when he worked with them and so on, was an extension of his own very intense dedication to music. He felt, and many of the musicians who worked with him have told me about this over the years, he felt that if someone was not completely dedicated to his work as a musician, he shouldn't be a musician. He should do something else. He used to say, be a shoemaker, be a pharmacist, do something else. If you're doing this job, this is the most important thing for you, and you must dedicate yourself to it. Toscanini arrived at La Scala for the first time as a performer for the 1886-1887 season. He was not yet 20 years old. He played at the world premiere of Verdi's Otello, second cello. He followed the rehearsals led by Verdi and the conductor Franco Faccio. He came here for the first time to conduct in 1896 at the age of 29, conducted a series of concerts that were tremendously successful, so successful that he was then invited to become principal conductor, what we would today call music director and artistic director of La Scala, beginning with the 1898-1899 season. He immediately implemented a number of changes at La Scala. He had the laterally opening a velvet curtain installed to replace the painted front drops. He conducted here for five seasons in a row. He left in 1903 after one of many disputes with the management, but returned two years later, actually three years later, 1906-1907 season. Also during those first two periods at La Scala, he implemented many reforms. He made the orchestra a more stable element of the theater. He had the first orchestra pit installed here. Importance of the orchestra was becoming greater and greater during that period. It was important to have the orchestra lowered so that they wouldn't drown out what was happening on stage. He left in 1908 to go to New York to conduct the Metropolitan Opera. He was there for seven years. He came back to Italy at the time of the First World War. And after the war, he was asked to resume the artistic directorship of La Scala, which was then reformed for him. Also, the box holders, the people who had 
actually owned their individual boxes in the theater were expropriated and the boxes were put on sale by subscription and single tickets like all the other seats. He conducted eight very, very important seasons here that many regard as the golden age of La Scala. He conducted the world premiere of Puccini's Turandot in 1926, Puccini's last opera, which the composer died before having finished the last scene, and many other works by Italian composers. Many of them have since fallen out of the repertoire, but were important in their time. Before uh, starting this new project of the Ente Autonomo in 1921, took the Scala Orchestra. He created basically a new orchestra, auditioned players, the best players from all over Italy who wanted to perform here, took them on tour all over Italy and then to the United States and Canada. After having been attacked by fascist hooligans in 1931, he refused to perform again in Italy. He said, I will not perform here again until the regime and the monarchy, which has permitted the regime to hold power, are eliminated. And he came back in 1946, after the Second World War, at the age of 79, to conduct the reopening inaugural concerts of La Scala, which had been restored after the Allied bomb damage of 1943. That was really probably the culminating moment of his entire career. After that, I mean, his work was basically centered in the United States. He was conducting then the NBC Symphony Orchestra, a radio orchestra that had been formed for him in 1937. But he continued to come back to Italy and to conduct occasional concerts at La Scala from time to time. His last concert here took place on the 19th of September, 1952. He was 85 years old. He gave an all Wagner concert that was attended by more people than could uh, legitimately fit inside the theater. Ci colleghiamo con il teatro alla scala di Milano. Suonare con Toscanini è sempre un fatto eccezionale, anche per noi. Il concerto di Toscanini alla scala in quel teatro che è suo più di ogni altro. Toscanini appartiene sì a tutto il mondo, ma Milano e la scala avanzano, come dire, i diritti di una affettuosa esclusiva. Nini created a new way of approaching opera. It was a way that Wagner and Verdi and composers of the 19th century had wanted to create, but nobody had really succeeded completely in doing it. He imposed his will on the performers. Here at La Scala, of course, the musicians as Enrico Minetti, who was the concertmaster of the Scala Orchestra, said, we feared him, we admired him, and we loved him, because they understood that this harshness that he applied to rehearsals was in part practical, a time saver, but in part his striving to achieve the maximum in every performance. After his death in 1957, his coffin was placed in the foyer downstairs of La Scala, and his funeral was attended by 40,000 people in the city of Milan, which was his adoptive home. Toscanini was already famous when he became conductor of La Scala in 1898, famous within Italy, and within a few years his fame had spread all over Europe and even to America. His international fame really became very strong at the time of his appearances at the Metropolitan Opera in 1908 and thereafter. Of course, in the age of media, his fame spread even further. He was conducting on the radio with the New York Philharmonic. Some of its concerts were broadcast already in the 1920s. And by 1934, nine million Americans 
which was 7% of the population at that time, were listening to his radio concerts with the New York Philharmonic. That would be the equivalent of 22 million today. By 1930, when he conducted, he was the first non-German school conductor to work at the Bayreuth Festival, the Wagner Festival in Germany, and then conducting elsewhere across Europe as guest conductor and not only within Italy and the United States. And his fame was further increased by his very strong and well-known, publicly well-known stand against Nazism and fascism. He was against any form of racism or nationalism taken to the extreme. In 1936, he went to Palestine at his own expense to conduct the first concerts of the orchestra that is now the Israel Philharmonic, made up of Jewish refugees from Germany and other European countries. By the 19. 40s, he was known, he was then by then living in exile in the United States, outside of fascist Italy. And in 1948, he conducted one of the very, very first concerts on television with his NBC Symphony Orchestra. He was then 81 years old. He didn't do it for the fame. He did it because he wanted music to reach as many people as possible all over the world. He felt that that was his mission in life. And by the time of his retirement in 1954, they say that 70% of the entire population of the United States knew the name Toscanini and that he was a conductor, even if they knew nothing about music. I'm sure that that percentage was even higher in Italy at the time. Mm -hmm.